My name is Robbie Nock, and I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship and Professional Practice at Art Center. I am really pleased to bring you the second part of our Everyone, the Rebrand of the Rebrand program. We uh, started this last Monday with uh, a, an overview of, of the rebranding process and an interview between Gloria Condrup and Susan Griffin Black with great insights from Jose on the design side. And now we're going to take a much closer look at the tactics and strategies and implementation of this rebranding process. Uh, and what we're uh, offering this in collaboration with the Hoffman Smoking Center for Typography. Thank you for the partnership there, Gloria. And, uh, and Susan Griffin Black, if you are listening today, we are so pleased uh, that you um, have offered your insights and, and this uh, process exploration with us. So uh, as everybody knows, Jose Caballer, he uh, is a remarkable designer and entrepreneur, had a career that moved from the agency world in the early days of online into uh, design education and building an entire platform for creative entrepreneurs and designers, uh, and, and then has since moved through technology and consulting and is a brand strategist and, and visionary um, that we are very, very proud to partner with for programs like this uh, and a big supporter of the Bold platform uh, at Art Center. And then Jeff Silva, who's also an amazing entrepreneur, designer, innovator, started his career in product and packaging design at Johnson & Johnson, has started his own companies, uh, including a food uh, startup in, in Brooklyn, and then most recently has co-founded a studio and agency called Content PK. And Jeff is really uh, a, an amazing visionary at the intersection between packaging and implementation, and really seeing how uh, massive scale uh, at an at a organization like Johnson & Johnson, and really how to bring that thinking and, and strategy down to the startup level as well. So bridging those two approaches and uh, with a clear focus on sustainability and uh, community impact through all of his work. He's also one of our um, amazing alumni in New York, has represented Art Center there for many years as a chapter chair uh, and um, just a, a, a remarkable guy. So thank you guys. Uh, with that, I will, I will leave you to the next set of um, explorations and questions. The way that today will work will be, we're going to, to re-look at Jose's uh, analysis of the rebranding process, but we're gonna take a much longer sort of uh, timeline through that, uh, each of those stages that he shared in the first session last week. Uh, and so please, Ask your questions as you um, have them. You can put them in the Q&A and we'll address them at the end. If you put them in the chat, we will try to adjust, address them as we're going. This is the first time we've done an office hour session like this. It's really designed to be um, you know, a, a direct connection between the audience and our great uh, speakers here. So don't hesitate to ask questions and drive us down the pathways that you're most interested in. Uh, and with that, thank you, Jose and Jeff. Great to have you here. Thank you so much, Robbie. Um, and thank you, Jeff, um, for, for being part of this. Today's an opportunity really to ask questions and to uh, celebrate and, 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 and share like the, the work that's been done here. I, I see Greg Lindy in the audience, I see Amy. Uh, Selfan Kasana, just partner. Um, and I just wanted to start by saying, you know, that for me uh, as a teacher or as a designer who, who believes in education and in teaching, Jeff was my student at Art Center. And then we've worked together in the last three years uh, much closer in the professional realm. And he's an amazing human being. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, we're going to start by recapping the, uh, the, presentation that we did last week, but the difference being, um, please ask questions in the chat or also in the questions and uh, Robbie and Paloma, who do an amazing job at facilitating, will kind of answer it. And I wanna start out with two questions for the audience before we just dive into this. One is how many of you are Art Center alumni um, or students? And, and how many of you 
internally or externally as either professionals or as students have gone through the entire process of doing a rebrand outside of just the design, but also helping facilitate some of the strategic work. Just curious, um, anybody in the audience can answer that question in the chat. Um, that'd be awesome. So with, with that, I'm just gonna get started and Jeff, feel free to jump in and interject, you know, uh, the office hours today, everyone, uh, the rebrand of the rebrand. Um, what takeaways do we wanna leave you with uh, this is the main takeaway. I'm going to share it now here at the beginning. Uh, who you are and how you show up as designers matters. You are a leader in business. You can facilitate powerfully. You can lead change at all levels of an organization. We are makers of our own futures. That's a, a, a big takeaway from this conversation that we've been having uh, for this. But first, let me recap the journey. Uh, the challenge was to evolve and elevate the everyone brand in a mindful way that accounts for the people, culture, and process. Uh, everyone is one of the brands from EO Products founded in 1995. Uh, it's a four benefit corporation in Marin County, has two brands, EO and everyone. And the challenge of taking a, a $70 million company that has very people focused values and a maker culture with in house teams primarily. Uh, in Marin County uh, to the next stage of its evolution after 25 years uh, was the challenge that was posed uh, by the team that really brought us in. This is an outline of the, the timeline uh, that you're gonna be witnessing or seeing you know, from October, 2019 uh, doing discovery through uh, May, even though the project extended a little bit longer than that, this is the primary timeline that we're looking at. Uh, prototyping, validation, refinement, and validation. Again, I'm going to start with the proposal uh, for those of you who are practitioners. Um, the story I heard is from uh, my stakeholders early in October 2019, uh, the co-founder Brad Black and Tom Fiegel, the president at the time, now CEO, uh, were having a conversation and, and, and focusing on how to make EO products, uh, the brand practice, uh, taken it to the next level. And how can we do this? And Tom said, I know a guy and my phone rang and I answered the question. I answered the phone. And then we worked together to put together a proposal uh, outlining the goals, EO products is in the process of brand transformation from a strong grounded foundation to a brisk connected and authentic growth period. And it needs allies uh, who can help grow and thrive while staying grounded in our core values and pursuit our immediate business objectives. This is a slide from the proposal or from the deck that we used to have the conversation about the project. And um, allies, when that came up, you know, I immediately thought of Jeff, also because of his extensive experience in consumer packaged goods and CPG. Um, outlining the process, brand alignment, and, uh, getting creative um, worked on, and then also setting up a brand studio. That was a very physical being under one uh, kind of metaphoric roof, but also literally because they were in different areas of the company. Um, you know, what does it look like? What does the space look like? Um, and the objective of the studio was to really align and unify the culture first around this new vision uh, that Tom was leading. And second, to create a physical space needed to create effective grounded collaboration. And it was the first step to bringing everyone to the table, literally, because when you see the pictures of the brand studio, those are a manifestation of this. Uh, we showed like how we would put process together um, you know, outlining brand, customer profiles, business priorities, all in a physical space, and really ultimately about aligning the essence of who EO products, and in this case for today, everyone is, and the customers and the goals of the companies and their uh, KPIs, and not ignoring, you know, at the center of all that, the core of it was really what we wanted to do. And of course, really focusing on alignment, because sometimes the path is very, uh, you know, windy because of the, the differences in people's points of view or, or even language. And getting those things to now match was really an important thing, especially between marketing and creative and product and the founders. This is very much a story. And last week you were able to see Susan share her part about you know founder collaboration with the teams in the shift towards uh, this new phase of the company. Um, looking at the prioritization, this is even before we started. And Jeff uh, helped put this together, which is really looking at the cadence over the months, you know, between October and uh, Q1 of 2020, which was a big deadline we were heading towards was a trade show 
uh, that uh, you'll see. Uh, and really listening, uh, what we heard, this was again in the deck, a passion for design and elevation, how we stay grounded while innovating, how do we execute across all the different um, components. So really the takeaway from the proposal process, and this is just a few slides, is listen, understand, read it back, align, and then agree on the approach and um, move forward, though that's gonna change very quickly once you actually go into the operations. Um, and the discovery phase is really like landing as missionaries in, um, in Marin County and really immersing ourselves in the uh, culture. And there you can see Amy uh, and Jeff shopping at Target. And you know, we did a lot of shopping, a lot of walking around stores, comparing knee highs with the community, <laughs> uh, just more shopping. Uh, Jeff is just a pleasure to shop. But if we could just get a job shopping, that would be really awesome. Um, talking to people on the street, asking them if they knew the everyone brand, um, going to the art store and buying all the boards and not being able to get out of the car because um, we actually strapped it to the roof. And then really just, this is the first week, the first few days of landing, what are opportunities, priorities, the team, like we were just overviewing the entire kind of operation, getting to know the stakeholders. These are two of the primary stakeholders looking and researching at previous efforts. This is from a private equity firm who put together a study of the brand uh, in, in an earlier stage, uh, about a year or six months before, um, and giving feedback. Uh, also different uh, uh, iterations that the internal team had done in the past, understanding the history. Uh, and Jeff, you know, you can talk about this eth ethnography, uh, knowing and listening to where the identity came from. It was all in the stories. Jeff. Yeah. So you know, just going back quickly to that one chart that Jose meant, um, displayed, you know, we, we created that kind of process diagram. One thing, you know, in the beginning, and one thing that we want to call out is, you know, we presented this to, um, you know, the stakeholders, so both uh, Brad and Susan, as well as their new CEO, um, just to give them some confidence in regards to this is the process that we're going to take the entire team in a rebrand. And, you know, what I think what's important to acknowledge is that, you know, throughout the kickoff or, you know, the mission, I think uh, Jose told me when, when he mentioned that this was going to be like a, a mission, like a, a Navy SEAL Team 6 mission. Um, I think the important thing is know that there was a lot of adjustment, right? There was a lot of adjustment between this kind of formal looking document and, um, you know, in hindsight, how it actually panned out. And I think that's important um, to call out that, you know, we had our kind of protocol and, and our ducks in a row in regards to how we want to attack this rebrand for a, a 70 million dollar company but we took a lot of steps in between to to really be empathetic and understanding of what the founders um the new ceo the dynamics of the organization and dealing with um the design and marketing team who have never worked together in one room um but, I, but so and the one room is a really perfect metaphor physically, then there's the issue of virtual, but, uh, and the Content BK team, Jeff and Amy's company and, and with other collaborators uh, did an amazing job, very in-depth and the experience showed, and, and we'll talk even about that aspect of it a little bit more. Um, but, you know, these are from the 360 audit of just the industry, the competition um, and the portfolio that everyone had, just seeing a lot of this, uh, for the first time in one place was really uh, uh, very, very, very useful. Uh, and then, of course, at the end of that week, you know, we had a, a happy hour with um, the teams and just really the, the bringing the people together. The brand alignment phase, really bringing everybody into the into the room. Some of you might be familiar with these exercises. Um, product architecture, like really looking and understanding at where products were and both sales velocity preferences, people had their babies, you know, I like this line, et cetera. And really pushing the team together to talk about and cut like product lines, you know, it's called skew rationalization as I learned, um, you know, and that, that in itself, uh, conversationally bringing people to the table was super important. Um, then taking all of the data that was gathered and synthesizing it into slides and into even more than slides, we made posters of these and put them up in the brand studio. Uh, customer needs, um, business uh, priorities, you know, marketing priorities, operational priorities. Um, you know, you can see these are very, you know, clear. The top three in red 
uh, up leveling our core set of products, removing low performance, skew rationalization. That came from the session. So our orders were being created in line to uh, the process. Importantly, then translating the idea of how do you translate attributes uh, into uh, visuals. So that's an interpretation on, on my part based on the definition of what you know welcoming meant or playful meant or community meant. Um, movement, which was one of the attributes, was really uh, very uh, important in this poster uh, wall here or this reference, but will play an important role in the future. Skew rationalization is rationally going through each skew and understanding, you know, it, should this be part of our product line? You know, that's the rationalization part. Um, what are the, what's the sales velocity? Uh, is there a lot of inventory? of this particular product. Um, it's just really looking at things very objectively. Yeah, the process um, there that was new, I think Jose, you you ran a work session there, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the idea of skew rationalization is uh, really against the retailers, like what, you know, Walmart per se, they're really high on sustainability metrics, et cetera. And they wanna make sure that, you know, the, um, the SKUs you have, you know, on, on their sales sheet or on the planogram are the best selling. So it, it sounds like a, a, a big feat because you have to get rid of product. And I think one of the things that, that Jose did for that, that one work session was, um, and there's another picture you're not seeing, maybe we'll have it in another slide, is this idea of, okay, you guys need to print out all of your SKUs in a portfolio um, you know, across both companies. Um, does it matter you know, what the sales are and list that by category so we could have a visual representation um, leading the team across all the, um, you know, the departments, marketing, sales, um, product design to be in a room um, and to have a discussion and literally Xing the products that they felt weren't um, going to drive or increase sales in the future. Um, so I think that sort of uh, work session was, was, was extremely uh, valuable. Very and, valuable. And you is um, to represent one product. If you look at the, you know, there's a barcode on each product. Yep. How many, you know, so the this is one SKU in the center in the GT's kombucha uh, brand. Um, the 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 design process or the divergence process was uh, about just throwing a lot of stuff out. Uh, stylescapes. Um, uh, here's the brand attributes. Um, if you see these pink stickies on each, those were. Um, people voted and kind of came up and looked at what they liked. And we were listening to the conversations, including from opening it up to the company. But, you know, you see Jeff here in the corner listening uh, to what, you know, the founder is saying from each. This particular design uh, exploration has a lot to do with, you can, the response to it guided a lot of the de design decisions mm -hmm. moving into, into the future. So it, it, a lot of the work was never, you know, manifested. It was just doing a lot. And yep. showing a lot, and part of that was just to shake up the possibilities, knowing that it had happened in the past, uh, but then really including more people and including a conversation and letting it breathe. Because I, I even didn't feel that in that first pass that we did that anything was necessarily different things about different directions resonated. There wasn't yep. like this is a solution, which is what designers sometimes try to go for. Like let me hit it, um, and that's really a misnomer. Even bringing like the head engineer for the company, mm -hmm. you know who. Operated the, the 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 physical plan and having him in conversations you know having all of the competitive audit plus references on the wall uh education was a super important part you know jeff did uh, a lunch and learn where he shared a lot of the process from his experience with the johnson and johnson brand studio that was really important sharing you know having right. crits and having um you know sh shared activities you know we created these parties at the end of the week but everything was also visualized and on boards so that the conversations could continue. This is Greg Lindy, who's here in his work, uh, who we brought as a collaborator to help. I don't know if Greg is still here. Um, yeah, he is. Uh, to help with the explorations of the logo mark and Jeff recommended and had worked with him at Johnson & Johnson. Um, and he did an amazing job at kind of helping us look at what all the possibilities were at a very technical level, typographically, it was just a pleasure to have someone with that level of um, uh, understanding and technical ability and, and vision. And interestingly, these were explorations of the existing mark. It's not where we ended up. And the reason why we ended up there is an interesting one. But in the explorations, you know, this was a direction that really got a lot of really great response 
um, from the stakeholder body. But we, again, um, at all times, we are taking what we're doing and then we're putting it up and getting to listen to what people say about it. Like here's one of the founders, just really what he, the question was simple, what you like and what you don't like. Um, and you know, what, what, this is a guideline that I use for consulting or for, you know, uh, and it's really listen, see the person and really try to understand that's the more intellectual part. Um, and then really feel, which is the more, you know, intuitive and emotional part, mm -hmm. like what's being, you know, what the reality is. So the first step towards change is total awareness of the possible. So the divergence process was like, here's all the things that are possible. And Jeff, his team, multiple freelancers, you know, just, just put together a bunch of work. Um, it was also to show the team, the cadence of what was possible with a small team. Um, validation was then really taking all the things that you just threw up on the wall and then saying, okay, from all of those things, what are we understanding? And, and for the first time the company did, and we worked together with them to put together a focus group and uh, you have to prototype you know, the products. Here's Amy prototyping and taping. It's like art school. We were in art school, <laughs> it was super awesome. Uh, the, the sets of the product families, setting them up against competitors, you know, uh, we were zooming, broadcasting it and the team could watch live, you know, the actual uh, focus groups uh, from, you know, a, a safe space. Uh, and then really also the validation of the company as a whole, like just bringing it over. And even at that point, we hadn't really hit anything where the founder, where Susan was really happy. And mm. she's, she's a collaborator. She's the creative director. She's the the visionary of the product. And she kind of uh, said, what do you think about it? Amber, she had been thinking about that for a while uh, to switch the bottle to another color. Um, and Jeff, I said, I texted Jeff and he put something together very quickly, texted it back. And I made the mistake of removing the label. And I'm like, oh my God, it looks really cool. If it was a clear label. And I texted that to Susan immediately. And she got excited. The next day it was on the all hands meeting, like, you know, uh, to show the, the the direction that was being going that we were going into, and then from there it's like really beginning to converge. The issue, the technical issue of the everyone uh, uh, logo mark being condensed uh, manifested here is that because the typography was all the same, uh, condensed, bold, sans serif, um, you know, a prize if you know what font this is. Um, it didn't feel like it felt like it was just text. It didn't feel like it was a logo mark. So the solution, because the thematics that had emerged was the idea of geometry or circularity and, and the whole concept was developed about essential modernism based on the heritage of the brand uh, was to make it geometric. And I just text, uh, emailed uh, Greg, or I think we might have had a call, I don't remember, Greg, you might recall, and said, okay, let's just go geometric. And we also tested it and prototyped it. But then the circles became uh, an important thematic, which there's a concept aspect to that about consciousness and about you know a spirituality that's kind of embedded into it very subtly. But then that really moved the momentum forward of the family set as we were going towards Expo West, which was, again, this is prototyping for a trade show, but at the same time, really making a lot of decisions and again, looking at and comparing it. It's almost like a, like a, like a timeline. It's like, you're really making these orchestral maneuvers in the dark of like, you know, adjusting, cleaning up and the separation of the logo mark being geometric and the typography on the package being condensed um, now begins to allow for the brand to separate a bit, mm -hmm. bringing the naturals aspect of it, which was originally brought in by this color that they called khaki, that, it's, that we called khaki, uh, into the bottle now being amber, which is, you know, a reminiscent of apothecary and like uh, more natural but with the label still having that contrast of it being very uh, modern and uh, modernist specifically and, and, and different than what most naturals are, which it's one of the things that uh, drove Susan and, and the design in general. Prototyping all of these, you know, the work, it was so much work in so little time, you know, Art Center, uh, if you've suffered and struggled through Art Center's packaging program as I did and Jeff did, um, this was nothing. I mean, I think Max, who uh, is a, one of the senior creatives there, could teach uh, you know a packaging class and, and just blow people away at the amount of prototyping that's done. But then really visualizing it and making it real uh, for Expo West, 
the poster series, like I said, and the inspiration from the style uh, from the uh, references really was what uh, got caught on by the firm that was designing the uh, booth. And we came up with that concept of like, okay, let's make it a, a, a whole poster wall, like, you know, in an urban setting. And, and then again, all that evolution is very collaborative because it was in the reference set. We put it into that. It was seen, the brief was seen by, um, by, the, by the, the firm, Elizabeth Fries and her team. And, and then suddenly that became part of the booth. Now, the sad part of that story, and you'll, we'll get that to in a minute, because it's, 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 all this work was done in very quick turnaround, both the rebrand, but also the uh, activation for Expo West. Um, months of a bit later, we continued the process, you know, into uh, validation to actually land the final design. So this is the timeline. It's, it's, it's jumped right here into March of 2020 or beyond. And uh, the team, Content BK team, did an amazing time, a, a job getting ready for qualitative online because at this point, COVID uh, is part of the story, um, and really listening. And in, in this, I'm sharing this screenshot because this is where one of the key comments was made by one of the 26, 27 people that were in the, in the, in the group uh, that were being tested. And we got to watch all those videos. We got to see it. There was a really amazing portal um, from the company that did the, the, the qualitative uh, research, um, what they liked, what they disliked. But the best test is just show it to kids. They'll be really honest. This is uh, the president, Tom's son, who just, totally told us exactly what he thinks we should do for the rebrand. And we're like, all right, I'm going to make this guy creative director because I obviously, um, it was awesome. So that this next part is really COVID hit in March and we started working remotely. And a lot of what the brand studio was now had to be done, you know, online. So how do you visualize things? How do you have these collaborative sessions? So the tools, you know, Google Hangouts, Zoom, Google Slides, and Google Docs, of course, we're familiar with those, but Slack, we're somewhat familiar with. Mural, one of the most important ones was Figma that uh, we, uh, towards the um, end of the time that I was there, we really started uh, working in, and then Asana for project management, daily standups, all these different tools. Uh, earlier, before COVID, we started putting teams into pods that were not departments, they were kind of cross and testing how it worked like in pods, running in Agile, of course, running on Zoom and Slack, uh, having to keep culture and you know fun, planning um, alignment so that people could work autonomously from home, having very clear agendas during these sessions, setting up monthly cadence of all the rituals and all the things that needed to be done to keep the train moving, um, defining the sprint objectives, You know what does done mean? We were using Agile, uh, um, and teaching and, and, and spent two months. Mary Gribben, and I don't know if she's on this call, who's my partner in the system, uh, she joined uh, around that time in the summer and we started really training the team. And she's very experienced in remote work and mural facilitation uh, from her time at Consensus, which was a remote first company. So we were bringing all the best practices and designing how the team and the culture that itself work uh, not just only doing, you know, the visual design, divide, design uh, roles and responsibilities become really important, like on the design team and across the teams, planning with the teams, you know, on a consistent basis. Um, Figma, which was an amazing kind of discovery and being able to work remotely and see the changes happening as they're happening and go in and make changes myself or whoever needed to do it. So what does the final uh, design look like? Uh, we can share some of it, you know, you can see like where the logo mark and where the identity and again, thank you to Greg Lindy for doing such an amazing job on the typographic work on the logo mark. Um, it's just beautiful. Um, and then beginning to see that manifest and I don't know how much of this you've seen Greg, uh, how it plays out in retail, etc. But we can't show you the packaging yet. So here's the top secret preview. It's kind of hidden. Um, you know, it's like a redaction. The most important thing though is a human connection and really getting the teams aligned uh, on the, I'll call it spiritual, but on the real kind of like essence of who they were, the rituals of when people left, this was the day that Michelle was leaving, we did this really fun lunch and learn. Um, and, and, and even the rituals of my nails were actually painted blue and amber to represent the direction we were going once we decided. And those are the founders um, that are amazing people. And, and I, I believe that they're the next uh, iteration of like, you know, 
Patagonia founder like Chenard, just because if you watch last week, you can understand the level of integrity that goes in. Uh, Jeff and I put this together, Insights on Change Management. Uh, we talked about it, the SEAL team mission, you're coming in, um, you know, discovery, uh, learn everything, get immersed, dive in, education, lunch and learns, culture adapting, uh, really adapting. And Jeff said this, uh, we, there was so much adaptation. It was like a dance. It was, you're like reframing and reframing. Agile then allowed us to do that in a lot more programmatic and, 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 and uh, uh, organized way, which, you know, things change constantly. Um, empathy, really coming in with just love and understanding with everyone on the team. And, and if you losing that, it's a, it's a problem. Um, communications, you know, that's really critical. And I learned a lot about communications and about expectation setting. Um, but showing it here, you know, Jeff teaching and, and almost like it, it was, it was, it was a, it was a, such a multi-spectrum job of doing so many different things. And I think, um, you know, that Jeff, uh, it's a perfect embodiment of, you know, the, the ability to be uh, loving and patient and like, giving you know teacher and partner in the creation of the work with a team because it's a team you're not doing it by yourself um you know and this is really from the thinking uh, beyond that what were we attempting and what we were moving for from if you guys want to see it you know at the core of it you know having the essence of the brand itself but really not just only for the experience uh, and the customer experience you know which is the top but at the bottom the culture and the employee experience like being able to have what, you know, below in the employee experience and above in the customer experience was one unified brand uh, and trying to execute that, you know, both in the marketing and design of the packaging, but also in the process and in the way that the team itself collaborated was really the challenge. And it's what we do at the system, which is not just the surface, we also do the inside. And that's a, a, a the, the kind of like a, a, an important takeaway. And at the end, what do we want to leave you with? Understand the business, know the power you have beyond just like, you know, Illustrator and, you know, Photoshop or Figma or more. Um, show up with equanimity, you know, it's like, can't react. It's going to all be going sideways all the time. Things are going to, there's, there's, everything is always going to be a problem. It's not ever going to be like, oh, smooth sailing. It's how you show up and how you look at it and have fun. Fun was really a critical part. And what I said at the beginning, who you are, like as a person, individual, you with the full spectrum of who you are and how you show up as designers matters. Um, you are a leader in business. You can facilitate powerfully. You can lead change at all levels of an organization as designers. Um, we are the makers of our own futures. So that's really my message at the end. And you guys can check it out on Instagram, everyone products, and you know, really get to know the product as the evolution continues. And now with the teams um, uh, continuing, um, and here's another, another usage of it, uh, Greg Lindy, we are everyone. That's it. Can you talk about what it feels like to be in the room, tensions, energies, and how do you manage that? Yeah, that's a, almost like a, a master facilitator. And I'll bring this up if anybody wants to look at any other slides or you want me to go back, Jeff. Uh, let's take it from your point of view, Jeff. What does it feel like to be in a room? You know, you, you... you know, I, I think um, because of the, we, how, the way we set it up, you know, I think there's two ways you can go about design reviews, right? Um, and I know we discussed this plenty uh, during the divergence phase. You know, do we show up and have a more formal presentation to the founders? and the acting president, you know, where, you know, it's set up with some sort of strategy and design divergence, research, competitive space, et cetera. We decided because, you know, we were immersing ourselves in discovering kind of the space, the company, um, there are too many moving pieces. So I think the, the way we positioned the, um, that kind of first uh, session or presentation was really like a work session and a discussion, very informal. And um, I think if, if I'm correct, um, it was more like a celebration or like a party. And it wasn't about necessarily just the design itself, but it's about making sure that every uh, stakeholder in the company was, was um, privy Heard. to it, and that they had the ability to it. And so that's what you saw um, a lot of post-its, a lot of different people from a lot, um, you know, from operations, from marketing, 
sales, etc. And it was an opportunity for them to tell us, you know, what they liked, what was uncomfortable, but also selfishly, uh, uh, you know, an opportunity for Jose and I in that time um, to understand where they're coming from, because there's a lot of um, heritage, you know, that we didn't know. And that, that was, I think, an important part that when coming in, um, that we were making sure we weren't outsiders with a point of view, um, but that we were outsiders kind of understanding where they came from. Um, so there was no tension at all. I think some, some designs were a little uncomfortable, some were, um, were inspirational. And so we captured that as we you know, went on with the design divergence phase. I mean, there was tension in the room uh, relative and feeling it is more about understanding the narratives and the stories. Um, you have to do it with equanimity, you know, Robbie. You have to, you can't be attached to any of it or who the status is. People sometimes align politically, like, oh, these are the founders. These are, I, I try to facilitate in a way that it kind of includes everybody and that kind of lets the rules in the facilitation session are you can say anything, participate, you have to participate and have fun and creating the safe container. But on one on ones and in side conversations, you can understand the dynamic tensions between different stakeholders. And Robert Goodwin is asking that, uh, you know, connections, communicate, connections, communication, bonding, COVID challenge. How did you overcome the transition to totally online? You know, we were prepared and primed for it because we had, I had introduced Agile very early on and we started putting it into very casual sprints. And even the, the parties were really just, they were retros or they were, uh, what what the celeb I mix the celebration part in agile rituals with the review of the work into one. So we were reviewing the work. I bought snacks. I like made it really fun. There was music all the time. I had a little portable speaker. It was like you know, and people were like, "Wow, this is really fun." Um, it was just joyful. Changing that to uh, COVID, uh, post COVID. I personally, I mean, I was in San Francisco. I thought I I was very sick. Um, Thought I had COVID. I don't even know who it was. I got tested later. And it was very lonely to be in a room all by yourself. Literally, I was renting an Airbnb and I was just in a room all by myself. Um, you know, and then connecting with the team most of the day online. Um, it was extremely pr difficult personally for me. But when you get on Zoom or on, you know, uh, the, the video chat, you know, I'm happy I'm there. I'm, so it was extremely difficult, but the transition was easier because we had started already. And then Mary, who I mentioned, and I'll mention again, really helped me put and manage all of the different rituals and information and scheduling of all of the different components. And also as a skilled facilitator facilitate, we did quarterly planning with the entire team on Zoom, with Zoom rooms, with music, with breaks, with exercises, you really have to redesign the way that the interactions occur in the virtual space to become, you know, a parallel of how they happen in the physical space, but also to set up, you know, accountability and, you know, metrics and things that, you know, allow for the work to get done. Um, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's, it's a huge challenge, but, you know, we, over, we, we, we dealt with it, overcame it and did it, I think, better than you know, so that answers your question, Rob, I hope, let me know. Um, and then how do you manage multiple decision makers, especially with clients? Do you address change resistance? So the wall of Kant, which is from a, a, an author who wrote a book, uh, this will get you fired. Um, his name's also Greg, not Greg Lindy. Um, but um, the, the objections and one of the things that maybe we could have done better uh, was dealing with, um, the fact that you have sales and then you also have uh, operations. Those events, you know, that one of the events that you saw the picture of um, was really to bring in people from uh, those areas of the company into the uh, process and have them see what was coming. So that immediately started, you know, the, the, the back channeled conversations about what we're changing the packaging and, um, all the different uh, repercussions of that uh, would be started to kind of become apparent because we were making everything so public, right? So you do have to share, you know, what's happening with the rest of the company so that those conversations end up happening. Um, and we were really, I'm listening in an earpiece to the commands from my 
stakeholders it's like okay we need to do uh, uh, socialize this with sales and with um, operations now I could have set up a meeting and like shown it to people I said instead I invited them to a party and everything was there and we had a few slides so we talked about where we were in the process so my my I like it better when it's together and when it's fun um, is that good or bad there's some I would say you need to be able to mix both well the one-on-one -on -one communication there was a lot of fluidity I think you know it's important to also um, you know, point out that there are many times where, you know, because of a small company, Susan, you know, the founder or even Brad in the early, you know, time would, would basically come into the war room, the brand studio room that, you know, we created. And then sometimes, you know, discussions would happen very ad hoc, you know, I remember one time Susan coming in and I think she chatted about the Amber decision. So basically changing all of the, you know, uh, P, uh, PCR, PT substrates that were generic to a Amber bottle. And I think, what was it, about two hours, a two-hour discussion that we had with Susan, the pros and cons of Amber, um, kind of understanding, you know, um, the perception of Amber um, in the space, et cetera, and, and then the implications that would take. And I think that was important because, you know, um, we talked about this in the last session, that making one switch, even though the form is the same, um, you know, the substrate isn't and the color isn't. So there's a lot of um, formulation that we needed to do um, for this color and what that meant is what that meant is a lot of change parts from a production perspective. Um, yeah. So the one on ones were were equally as important as kind of the the larger discussions. I'm not great at one on ones and and I've had to learn to get a lot better at those. But um, does that answer the question? And then that, the, Patricia, how do you manage multiple decision makers, especially with clients? How do you address change resistance? You know, one thing we implemented was you know a system, and it's not visualized here too too much uh but it was it was it was basically a check system inside our decks where you can put a little green check or a no and then you can also put notes uh inside the deck that we were presenting uh, any directional changes uh they were obviously recorded also um, and then you really read it back to them this is a decision you, you made and you know this is what we're moving on and uh the the i don't know the, the you have to have real conversations and there has to be kind of the ability to do that and, and to do it without any like, you know, designers, eh, they get cranky or they get scared. A lot of that is, you know, tied to your agreements and to the budgetary and the container of like your scope. Um, in this case, we were doing this as a mission internally. We weren't like an external agency coming in and kind of control. We were there, we were on the inside. So this was kind of oh. an inside job. That, that changed the dynamics of the client relationship because we were internal. I was the interim chief brand officer and I was acting on behalf of the company. And that's how I acted. And that's how I act even with clients. It's like, I'm here with you and for all practical purposes, I, I work for you. Um, you know, I don't know, Patricia. How, change resistance, there was a lot of that, trust me. There had to be a lot of presentations convincing, but the data, the, all of the validation uh, points uh, were what really uh, allowed for everything to move forward because we were all looking at the same data. And then when we came back and made a decision, we said, well, the data said this, we're going with that decision. It was almost like, you know, that Star Wars scene where you have to shoot like a, 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 photon, a photon torpedo right into like a little tiny hole. Like that's really, getting the direction wasn't about my genius individually. It was about understanding, listening and synthesizing everything that was being said uh, and the points of view of the designers and the points of view of the founders and the points of view of the team, and then having to make a judgment call on like, you know, where that meant, where that landed and then presenting it back and saying, here's the direction based on all of these factors. That's really the, the here's the direction based on all these factors that you are aware of because it's all been transparent. Hopefully Patricia that answers. Um, Nia Singh, thank you Nia Singh for your question. How often does it happen that the discussion becomes tangential with so many people in the room? It does. If you've ever seen or watched me facilitate, uh, you know, setting the rules, having a very strict agenda and stopping the conversations from going tangential, you have to feel powerful enough Nia, to just say it in the middle of the, I actually had to train the team in some instances, you know, uh, and we also started limiting who came to these decision-making 
um, meetings, just to a few. The early sessions during the discovery phase included a lot of people so that everybody felt heard and was part of the process. Then we started doing more limited sets versus the whole. So notice that the process is kind of like, you know, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And then at some point you have to open it back up and get everyone to kind of participate. But yes, I think it also, I think it also happens on what uh, depends on what the discussion is, right? If it's something, I don't know that we've had a lot of discussions on is how does um, a weekly Instagram or website page, like those things need to get live or pushed against the deadline, right? Those are um, less of a risk, but if it's something like changing the color of a bottle, which has numerous capital in, you know, um, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, expenditures, it's very expensive. Expenditures, yeah, it's very expensive, um, but also not only from a capital resource, but also employees, you know, the employees are gonna have to spend a lot of time understanding what this means. So I think it really depends on the, what, what the discussion's about. Um, I think what's yeah. important that we, is the transparency, the transparency you, between the stakeholders. You wanna include people. And Nia, the question for me as a follow-up for you, and you know, you can put it in the chat, um, is are you talking about like your willingness to either interrupt or drive the conversation? Um, or are you talking, you know, do you not feel powerful enough to do that in a client situation? Is that where that's coming from? Uh, or is it, you know, how do you do it programmatically in, in the system itself? Like, you know, in the agenda and, and here's what we're here to talk about. This is what we do. And yes, there are people in those meetings that go super off tangent or talk for a long time. And, and I allowed for some of that to happen for the most part. Um, and just only in very precise times where it was we were like, okay, we need to focus. Uh, and one of the exercises, by the way, is at the beginning of the meeting, uh, we have an objective for what we wanna get out of the meeting as a slide. And then there's an alignment exercise for these bigger sessions, which is what does each individual person wanna get out of it? And what I'm doing is I'm tracking like, like almost like a tracker. This person got that, this person got that. Like I literally put it on the whiteboard and make sure that every person got what they wanted out of the session. And at the end, when it's done, people feel super satisfied. But what my promise and what I said at the beginning is like, I wanna make sure we get through everyone's, and if we don't, that we then say, okay, we're gonna do a follow-up meeting to make sure that people got what they needed. That's a very formal way of doing facilitated sessions, um, but you can also do it you know, in your head and you can also, the, the, the way that it happens for the most part is usually based on power, right? Who has the most power based on their position in the company. But I try to diffuse that as much as possible. I hope that answers your question, yeah. Robert Godwin, changing the brand look of an existing brand is so risky, it is. Change is super scary, it is. Being in charge of change is even scarier. Oh my God, yes. Um, knowing that you can completely mess this up was one of the biggest fears that I had. And, and, and it's just like, oh my God, like I'm responsible for it whatever the outcome is, but really I deflect, not deflected, but I, I made it inclusive. What was the risk discussion prior to starting the design studio, the closed door version? Uh, it was more the risk of not doing it. So that's really kind of the innovator's dilemma and going back to, um, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember his last name, Greg, who wrote the book, um, uh, This Might Get You Fired. He talks about this issue that you have to pose the, the, the risk of not doing this as bigger than the you know, risk that you're taking on by doing it. And the executive team that was hired, and this is Maya May, who's the uh, CMO um, uh, of the company uh, who was brought in and, and who's amazing. And it was, she was an ally and a collaborator. And without her, we really couldn't have done a lot of the movement of this change forward. Cause she's just like, we're moving this forward and she's providing the confidence for that um, and this data is providing the confidence. So the closed door sessions was really, there's no choice, like this is this is it. And part of me coming in to do this and part of that conversation uh, that Tom had with you know Brad, the founder, was like, who can actually push this through? And at an astrological level, it's kind of like a very Taurus team. Like it's Jeff's a Taurus, I'm a Taurus, we're just driving this thing through. Um, but with mindfulness and gentility, and data and experience. So a lot of that had a part in that. Uh, hopefully that answers your question, Robert. Or that wasn't even a question. How do you find the creative direction after the brand attributes exercise? So Raglan, I mean, I showed you a bit of that, like um, th there's two parts that are super important 
that you should note. And uh, one of them is that the translation here, like what does playful mean? These are references for that. What does welcoming mean? Here are some references for that. What does community mean? Some references for that. These were the attributes. What does movement mean? And you see these posters, right? So when we said, hey, let's do a poster series um, you know, for, for the Bay, the design direction is coming from that. Obviously, they're not gonna be political 70s posters, but it, you know, love, you know, everyone is welcome. The references, you know, are all kind of relative to powerful kind of messaging, right? Or messages. We did a lot of divergence, like you did, you know, from the brand attributes, they can be interpreted in different ways, you know, and there's the brand attribute, you know, well, Jeff, for you, what, what how did you get to where you got? Because you were really leading the design. I'm, I'm just... <laughs> oh yeah. Ooh, I think you know it, it, the the question of that is kind of multi layered, right? Oh, like the the brand attributes is kind of thematic and and what we use to um, kind of drive the different concepts. And but we a lot of the stuff you're not seeing here oh, is kind of us looking at the design relative to competitors, right? You have kind of the brand attributes, but uh, you know rebrands don't come very often from a packaging perspective, right? It might come every five, 10 years, whatnot. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, the design was, wasn't only necessarily making sense for everyone, but was also iconic, was also differentiated, well-differentiated method from Dr. Bronner's, from Ms. Myers. And so we spent a lot of time understanding how important it was it to actually have the, the illustration of a scent, of a, of a lemon, of a lavender, um, you know, and understanding um, the how Susan's such a modernist and she gave us a lot of inspiration. So you're seeing this here that is basically like kind of um, dots that represent kind of flavors and the sense and kind of musically animated. So it, it's, it, it's not, you know, it's the, it's the attributes. It's also a lot of time us, of us understanding kind of the vision that Susan had because she has such a strong artistic modernist um, kind of vision. Um, and then making sure that it not, is not only unique to everyone, um, but it, it, it makes sense for the category, but it's also well differentiated from the category. So, you know, it, it, some of the, the issues that everyone had in the beginning was it looked very generic because the product descriptor, hand soap, um, you know, bath soap, et cetera, that doesn't say anything about the brand, that says anything about the product. And so we need to make sure that everyone was number one, you know, um, prompt, the number one prominent um, copy on the pack, you know? And I remember the first time I saw this on an Airbnb in New York, I thought it was generic. I thought it was a Walmart uh, version of soap um, because it didn't highlight anything unique. Um, everyone actually, I didn't even see everyone. Um, so, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it's basically the brand attributes were kind of the instigator in the process, but that wasn't the only element for the redesign. You have to really, the, the competitive audit, the shopping and listening to the challenges, uh, getting the right direction. And for those of you who struggle with this, it's not about just translating the attributes at an emotional level. They support your decision-making, but you have to get the content context business problems, all of those things, right? You know, the same way that there's in user experience, there's like UX, um, uh, uh, it's not playbooks, it's a U UX patterns. In packaging, there's patterns. Like, you know, the little pill with the, 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 the attributes, the product, the seal, all those things are patterns, you know, from packaging. There was a resistance to those patterns in the culture because they didn't want to seem markety or they didn't want to seem, you know, like, the other products, but we really diffuse those by integrating them into the concepts, like the circular concept, et cetera, like part of it. And also by looking at the response from the focus groups and from the qualitative and quantitative data, like people really rank the green seal super high as a perception of naturals. The very technical reason for the green seal was to take all of this copy down here made with plant pure extract essential oils, uh, which took up a lot of the packaging the real estate in the previous kind of iteration and condensed that entire message 
into a quick read seal that kind of said naturals inside a very modernist aesthetic. So interpretation is really, 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 re you really are required to understand the nuances of the patterns within the industry. Um, in addition to, you know, aesthetic decisions that, oh, this looks better, this looks, like, if you ask me, like, what would my aesthetic be for what the rebrand should be, would be a totally different thing than what should it be because of the business requirements, the needs, the stakeholders, you have to really be able to keep so much in your mind and have so much, that's why I have to visualize it all. That's why I have to put it all up in the, on the walls. Put it, doing it in decks and doing it remote is a lot harder. And there is a way that you can actually create that. And I, that's the problem that I'm solving now and trying to figure out is like, how do you create the thread of all of the decisions that have been made and all the options that are so that you can look at the story. Like if you look at somebody's Instagram and you look at their feed and you say, oh, okay, I can see the person's evolution. You can see the same thing in the process by archiving, documenting and then having it all in one place. Yeah. And just to build on that, and, and that relates to the last question about how scary redesigns are, well, you know, there, there's, um, there's measures that you have in place to, to minimize risk, right? And I think a big part of it is from an equities perspective, um, you know, there's a thing, Jose, you call it um, uh, mild, medium, and spicy, you know, evolution to revolution is another way of looking at it. So we made sure that the designs that we tested from a, from a consumer perspective Kind of hit the marks of it. This is really close to what the consumers are seeing today. Um, this, the, which is the the mild, the spicy is super far out. Maybe the ideal, like this, is if we didn't have constraints, this is what we do. Um, and then there's one in the middle, right? And the one in the middle is kind of a you know hybrid of really far out and and close in. And there it is here. And the goal is not this is final design. The goal is just to understand, you know, what are our levers that we could play. What consumers. Um, where, where are they going to give us the opportunity to play in the market, right? And, and so the one Evo is, is really close to existing with a, high, with a really prominent product descriptor. We wanted to keep it same. So when consumers look at that, um, the magic is that it looks like existing, but we know it doesn't look like existing. It, it's been cleaned up. Um, the middle is one where we have, you know, the logo, we have new icons. Um, but we're also looking at, at uh, scent illustration, right, to get a read on how consumers would react to that. Um, and then a far, further out one, which we love, was, you know, how do we become more abstract and, and kind of simplistic with the vernacular, the packaging? Um, and so based on this, we got a read that maybe that, that spicy revolution was, was too far out, but, but, but there are things that they liked about it, right, that we could pull back into kind of the final. The design. dots, the dots came from, from that. Yeah. And that made it into the final design. So it's like the iteration and over iteration. You're all, you, you are a cultural alchemist of time. You're looking at every single result and then you're moving forward. You know, that's an art form that you guys have to master as designers versus being fixed. Here's my presentation. Here are the changes. The client's job is not to tell you what to change. The client's job is to tell you what they like and they don't like and why. And your job yeah. is to tell them why based on the output and the input from both you know, and what if it's a small, you know, look, Jeff, let's talk about the reality. You know, we, we have half hour left. Let's talk about the challenges that someone's going to face when they're doing this on a smaller basis. We're talking here, this isn't Nestle or J&J, &J, even though we could do this process for some of those brands and, and come in as a SWAT team and, and do it for, for a bigger brand. But what if you're a small business? How do you address that? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think number one, it's, you know, it comes down to objectives, like business objectives, right? Like we work with a lot of startups and objectives. I, I, I'll tell you right now, a lot of times startups, you know, don't necessarily know where they want to be in 10 years. They just have technology or product or they have, they know the, they know what the technology is um, or the product is, but they don't really know where they want to be in five, 10 years. So I think what's important is understanding objectively from a business perspective, what you know, what you want out of this business, um, this product or a service, whether it's, you know, digital. Um, and then what, you know, what does it take to get there, right? Like we um, do a lot of uh, kind of invest decks and, you know, what's the problem solution? Um, we worked on a, 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 a little, um, what do you call it? Like a two week thing with uh, Jose's uh, systems and, you know, working with a, um, a kombucha company and, you know, what's really important is knowing, um, kind of understanding what that company stands for. Like, what's the why? What's the big purpose, right? How do you develop a product, a product um, problem solution statement? Um, how do you really stand out in the marketplace? Because a lot of, you know, if you were a small company, again, this is 
how I'm looking at it, you know, you have to really have those honest questions in regards to how you're differentiated and how, how you're really different from a consumer. Um, and then with, with those things in mind, um, val validating them, um, understanding kind of business modeling, uh, product market fit that Jose mentioned about, um, and then doing the test, right? Doing tests, um, kind of proof of concepts. And I think proof of concept is a huge thing. We did it at everyone. You know, you could look at this as a proof of concept of design um, to sell in the idea of how we want to move forward. Um, if, you're, if, you, if you're a technical a tech startup, you, you're going to do a, a POC and a beta testing similarly to prove the concept. Um, I think the big challenges with smaller companies that the resources, right? You don't have the resources and the bandwidth that, you know, um, obviously the big CPGs or even like an everyone has. Um, but we were able to do focus groups internally at a far fairly low cost. You know, you can do cheap, yep. you know, yep. user testing, you know, especially for digital products. I mean, I, I did it a lot for, yep. for products when I was doing startups. Um, like you put an ad on Craigslist and like you give people $100 gift cards and they come in and you kind of pre-interview them before you have them show up and you have a camera in one room and like people in the other. Uh, it's a bit technical to set up, but, you know, as an agency provider or as a, and there's platforms that do that just for digital and for marketing, you know, kind of components. I think so, that's, we should talk about yeah. that briefly because I think that's important too. Um, e, e, everyone, like a lot of companies, they outsource testing. Um, but the designs that you saw previously, um, you know, were, were not only designs we created, but we helped build the questionnaire and the testing methodology with the team internally. And, you know, um, I think they thought we were crazy, but um, Jose, and Jose um, with his experience in, in kind of um, these work sessions was able to moderate the the first ever qualitative um, research in-house. The, the advantage of that is empowerment of the team, um, but also um, seeing the team, like watch the entire team, and you, you're seeing a brand student here, watch um, in, in live kind of the, the consumers uh, reacting to the designs. So I think that was, um, that was, a, that was a big moment in, in everyone's kind of process when it came to testing. I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Jose. That you were no it, it's beautiful and it's something that's maybe outside of the wheelhouse of most designers you know because they haven't experienced it but um there's really simple stuff you know it's like a b or c medium and that's what stylescapes are used for it's like you have a b or c um that that in itself is a test what do you like what you don't like you document that and then you come up with another stylescape boom now you're closer but that's not validated by the market so whether you're designing a digital product or you're designing a physical product in this case there's a, a, you know, and, and Gloria Condra, thank you, Gloria, for being our teacher and our mm -hmm. amazing um, spirit guide in the world of packaging and ecology. Um, she asked the real, real question of where are you given a target price for the cost of manufacturing of the product that needed to be considered when starting the design process. We were not, but I did get to see all of the costs, the COGS, cost of goods sold, and I get to see the budgetary implications and the financial implications of the rebrand uh, behind the scenes. It wasn't something necessarily that, you know, was brought into the, the design or the marketing team per se, though they dealt with the reality of inventory of like, you know, uh, mm. warehouse and of like, you know, we need to do a co-manufacturing situation to increase inventory levels. They were looking at the data uh, on a weekly basis uh, in terms of, um, uh, e-commerce performance both on Amazon and so there's a lot of data and a lot of stuff that's happening as a designer or as somebody who's transitioned to being a leader in that space this is one of the first times that I've had oh. such kind of insights into the entire operational you know implications of the work that was being done and it's it's a lot you know you have to really it's a mastery level that uh, to be honest you know I have I hadn't gotten to myself and and maybe with this experience I'm closer to it and uh, as I move forward into the next things that I'm doing, uh, really becoming super conscious of how, mm. because at a service level, if you're a service company, if you're running an agency, you're really just selling people. So your cost of goods sold are really easy to kind of calculate, you know, it's what's your markup relative to your labor costs. And, you know, even somebody like me who isn't spreadsheet oriented, though I, I do use them, can handle that. But when you have the complexity of, you know, a product that's physical, um, it's, it gets really, it gets really, um, it gets really real and the benefits of PCR or, which is post-consumer, correct me, Gloria, 
post-consumer um, uh, resin or post-consumer recycle. Recycle. Um, it, 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 in the perceptual aspect in the market, uh, it's really important. And, and even though these are prototypes and not showing like what the what, mm -hmm. what what's going to market, the actual bottles and all those other issues, there's so many implications both at the cost level and at the manufacturing level and at the technical level. And I had a lot of empathy for the team because they had an internal team who Max being one of them and then Brad, another Brad uh, who did a lot of the production. And if they messed up something in the printer, in the printing of the labels, you're talking about, you know, a, a label order of a hundred thousand labels, you know, that's, that's, that's a problem. So if you're in the printing business, you know how, how much you know, it's writing on that. But yeah, so Gloria, hopefully that answers your question. Um, Robert Godwin, I'm in the printing business. Uh, nice transition up to that. I'm so pleased with the amount of print you have in your branding toolkit. Labels, posters, POP stands out of home, um, et cetera. I will talk about this in the next meeting. Uh, I'm not sure what, if you're talking about the futures toolkit for branding, uh, but... Um, I think the work that was shown like Expo West, like we had a lot of posters, oh. we had a lot of banners and you know, oh. we found the idea. Is that what you're talking about, Robert, in the chat? Um, yeah, that was part of a lot of the activation. Um, and it was, it was important also to visualize it. When you saw it in the design directions, it was like, what would it look like in the real world? When people feel that it's real and they can see like, ooh, that's what it looks like on the streets inside a picture. It really makes the design a lot more um, you know, and we have a lot of access today to those assets in the different creative asset marketplaces. Like you can buy a poster, a, a bat, a, a, you know, you can buy on creative market has amazing ones and you just replace all the graphics just to visualize it. And a lot of doing that, I learned actually from Tom in previous projects because he was my client, you know, like 10 years ago. And he taught me a lot about making it look real and presenting, you know, like make it look real. Um, so that's really important. Casey, just to clarify, after you did brand attributes, you dedicated some time to talk about the context and meaning of the attributes. Correct. Yes. We, 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 the translation took more than just that translation. There was briefs where we put references and uh, definition and like the full brief has references, definition, uh, et cetera. And then there was even a further iteration of that where we did this we, we created a thematic kind of anchor to what is the design aesthetic. Like, you know, if we were to name it, you know, like Muji has Wabi Sabi, EOP, or uh, in this case, everyone has, we call them um, uh, uh, modern essentialism, which is, you know, this modernist kind of aesthetic. Um, we gave it a name. We talked about it. We talked about the references. We talked about where it came from. We talked about why Susan, you know, it was, if you've been into graduate design programs, there's so much conversation about context. There's so much, you know, uh, sometimes too deep and esoteric, but that's really something that you have to master, which is having a meaningful uh, conversation about the why, you know, a client is choosing something. Where's it coming from? Go to their homes. That was really one of the things that we did in this case scenario, visit the home of the client, or in this case, the founders. You don't always have access to that, but it really gives you a lot of insights into who they are. And go to the home of the consumers. Using print to carry Robert Goodwin, a product on shelf branding have continuity of the product outside the retail and online. That's not a question, but yes, thank you, Robert. Uh, the relationship and uh, ask some hard questions like like hardball questions like stuff that you you, you want to know and, and i encourage you guys uh, to do that the relationship and interactions between design and other business functions is critical and usually interesting interesting to say at least thank you scott could you please talk more about the twists and turns in areas of rebranding especially surprise bits jeff do you have any twists and turns uh, about this yeah so you know, I think it helped. I think it helped from the beginning that um, there was there was a lot of transparency to the founders. You know, so we, we and Jose worked really closely. I think both of us, but Jose was like really, you know, um, holding their hands when needed. Right in times where I wasn't there um, to educate the founders, both Susan Black and the new president, in terms of. Um, process and design, right? I think every business stake, stakeholder wants design yesterday, 
you know, every business stakeholder wants obviously the best design that, you know, will, will put a stake for their, for the brand and for their product and company. Um, and so I think number one, it helped that we had a lot of, a lot of visibility to the founders and, 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 um, and, and Tom, um, to really understand what their expectations were for the rebrand and also the day to day and the week to week, you know, I think one of the advantages that we had is, it, you know, we weren't a trip, a typical agency that, you know, met once every other couple of weeks to present, we were fully embedded in the company. And I flew out, um, I think two or three times a month or so forth um, to spend actually quality time um, with, with everyone and the business, the business functions. So I think that, that was, I think that was a big part of it and that we weren't a, a traditional agency that just presented work and that we were fully embedded. With that. It's a different approach, Scott, that the agency model. And, and I don't, I, I really don't, I, I believe in the integrated model and really having a much more intimate connection. And that's per personally my style. And that's actually one of the reasons why Jeff was so important because our relationship and, you know, our ability to just connect and, and be there. And, and, you know, they were in the standups and, you know, there, it was, you know, Jeff is a unique, you know, being. Um, to have that capacity. And I look for other people who have that capacity to be, you know, super powerful and they're personal, how they show up personally. So, so there's a lot of stuff that, you know, you're asking about the twists and turns. So I'll tell you one, you know, I was super nervous and stressed. Um, and for me, um, about landing a direction quickly, um, because, you know, as time passed, you know, we were getting closer to Expo West and we needed to have a direction. Um, and, you know, Tom didn't necessarily, you know, pressure me like in a formal way, but I could hear it when he talked to me in the hallways. It's like, okay, are you going to land this thing? What's going on? I don't want to see any more freaking divergence, you know, like, you know, and I'm like, damn, I need to land. And this, this presentation came about from me. I called Jeff and Amy and I'm like, okay, 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 okay. And I, and we saw the packaging work that was presented and et cetera. And I'm like, let's just focus on campaign. Let's let's stop working on like, you know, and I knew, you know, that visualizing the identity and the rebrand in a campaign form would kind of take the pressure off, you know, the pa the packaging because we had parallel tracks. Like if you if you saw in the diagram, you know, up at the top. Um, and for me, you know, it was like uh, as a creative, it's like, you know, of course, you're like you feel responsible. We had the marketing work streams which are happening and we had packaging work streams, which is happening. And they were all leading up to the activation for Expo West. So it was a lot. Um, I, 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 I really kind of almost blew my gaskets uh, through the January, February, you know, right before March. Um, but this was, I think maybe in, in, in late January, early March, uh, or no, no, this was in, yeah, uh, late January, February, where I said, let's just focus on, a, on, on and then references and just talking it through, like Casey was asking about, you know, let's put a presentation with, and this is only one direction out of mul multiple directions that were shown in this format um, at, after stylescapes, after like the divergence process. This was now later in the process. And there were things that we knew from the previous process and from what people liked and didn't like, uh, and from knowing that things a little bit better with the concept you know, I came up with this, the elemental concept uh, of square circle it was something that I used with Greg Lindy and that I used with. So I, as, a, as a director of this movie, I'm coming up with, you know, references and themes that I try to use to activate the design team to come back. And, you know, Jeff and Amy did a really great job at responding to those themes. I put a very clear, like, you know, reference set and we had a real clear conversation about it. And when, when they came back and we presented this, people just lit up in the room and it was super exciting. You know, they, for the first time, saw something that was like, uh, um, you know, interesting. And it did have a huge impact and, and it got a really great response. So, but before that, I was super nervous that we weren't gonna land it. So this really was like, whew, okay, great. Now the next emergency. So everything is like going from one thing to the other. So you really got to figure out your personal you know, routines and like life and grounding really well because it's not for the faint of heart. Robert Goodwin, you were both trained as designers and have emphasized a strong business acumen. Where did you develop it? 
and uh, develop that and understanding of our data. Jeff, you talked a little bit about this in J&J, but at first you were like, ah. Yeah, yeah. So I worked at uh, both Amy and I actually worked at Johnson Johnson for about 10 years each. And, you know, I mean, this was an amazing project when Jose called me because I just have a lot of experience with these big CPGs and a couple of brands that I managed was like the global redesign for Town Hall and Band-Aid. And, you know, I think at that level, when you're dealing with billion dollar brands, business is critical. And it, it, it took me a few years just to really understand how marketers thinks. I, you know, went to Art Center, had one business class and, you know, um, was, that's not enough for any designer. Um, whoa, whoa, you had my class. And your class, yeah. Yours was a good one, yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of the brand strategy and consumer, but, you know, I think just being embedded at, at J&J for 10 years, um, is, is like a, an MBA. I feel like I have an MBA in that sense. Mine is the financial part. <laughs> um, working in and out on you know, with the teams, the marketing teams for redesign, not, not only from a, a packaging perspective, but also product, right? Coming up with the next iteration of, of product development. Yeah, and I'll make mine very simple. Um, uh, the, from, a, from an ancestry standpoint, my, my grandfather was like, you know, a peddler. He had a Toyota pickup truck in, you know, the Dominican Republic, and he sold pots, pans, toys, you know, knickknacks, paddy racks, you know, the whole thing. Um, and I loved hanging out with him and you know, seeing him like just, you know, just charm people and like just be really like amazing as an. He wasn't a great entrepreneur. Ultimately, my grandma ran it the whole thing, but um, uh, meaning he just liked talking to people. <laughs> I don't know if he was focused on selling anything. But then when I uh, started my own agency, which I think is the best design business school you can get. Uh, first, Mary kind of introduced us to MBAs and to people who helped us, advisors, and we learned a lot from them. And then I hired because I met someone who was a young MBA and was very open and willing to share with me, uh, hired him as a, as a collaborator to help grow our sales and our operational capacity. Um, and I got an MBA just from that. You know, so I was open to the collaboration. I let him do what he thought was right. Of course, I made some adjustments or gave my input. But ultimately, it's about being open and willing to talk to and be with people of a different language. You know, you should have a best friend who, or an advisor in your company and your business who is a business person. Um, and I read a lot. You know, I, I love reading. Right now, I'm I'm reading uh, Reed Hoffman's book Blitz Scaling about scaling startups. Um, whenever I need something, I'll read it. I don't read for the sake of it. I'm reading this book because I need it right now. So. That's really, I don't know, Robert, did that answer your question? There's many things. I think Bold and Art Center's kind of commitment to entrepreneurship is great. I think, you know, the impetus to that is what drove me to start the school to teach the business of design. And now, you know, led by my dear friend, Christo. Um, uh, so that's something that you have to kind of search out for yourself and uh, figure it out. But there's a lot available out there. Uh, Scott uh, says also, how representative is this example of a typical corporate rebrand experience? Jeff. Yeah, it's very, it's very consistent. You know, I think in the big CPG world, you know, it's very top down, right? Uh, command and control. Um, so, you, you know, if you want to take, for instance, you're doing a rebrand in the corporate world, there needs to be a business case, right? And that business case is provided to the team by a charter. It's a lot more formalities. But once that's established, you have the, uh, you know, the design kickoff, figure out your team have, um, and, and it's really about, ooh, I think what's different here is that a lot of the brand, kind of the strategy, the opportunity for a rebrand is, is, is done by marketing, ooh, right? That's where the divide, there's a lot of uh, research, market research with Nielsen, um, you know, to, to understand, and, and the teams like Nielsen, market research come to understand opportunity space. Um, there's just a lot more resources in, in, a, in a corporate world to do things. Um, but what we outline in terms of, you know, the, the strategy front aligned to that divergence, um, validation, convergence, validation, um, and, and finalizing design is very, very consistent. Um, just to give you an example, though, it's, it's, uh, it's resources and timing, right? A redesign for a CPG could take a year or two, you know, depending on how successful it is, where you know, we did this in what, like six months. And, and it wasn't the full execution of the rebrand yeah. because it's still going on now. The product won't come out till January of 2021. The freeze, yeah. We froze um, on market, Yeah, we froze six, 
it'll be six, seven months before the product comes out after yeah. the final result was selected. And, you know, again, I want to highlight just, just, just both as gratitude, but also the level of experience and the commitment and the technical understanding of what needed to be done, you know, to deliver, you know, and, you know, Max, you know, who, um, is one of the one of the leaders in the packaging side of things at the company loves you know Jeff and Amy because of the ability to kind of deliver you know deliver deliver and quality and knowing how to set things up and files all the technical components and again that's one of the reasons I personally I've never done a rebrand for you know a CPG company I worked in digital my entire career maybe a few instances of doing things for you know, companies that might have some expression outside of digital. And I'm also not a marketing guy. Um, so those things are very difficult for me. So the partnership with Jeff and Amy was super important. Uh, and really, without them, this I couldn't have done this, right? The team matters a lot. Um, uh, it matters a lot. The team matters a lot. Oh. And, and really grateful also for the spirit of the collaboration. Um, the, so this is fairly representative, even though the way and the style in which we did it is very different. This wasn't, it was a little funner and looser and more like just for me, philosophically, I like to work in an experience and most people share this. And Jeff, you, you mentioned this to me. It's like, oh my God, that was so much fun. When are we gonna do the next thing? And I'm like, ah. It was right. fun, it was fun. That's and that's, that's my gift. If you give me three months, and you know, complete you know access and authority to do whatever I want. <laughs> the party will start, and we'll get the stuff done, which is what we did mm. at EO. Which is like we had carte blanche to. There was trust in our experience and in our ability, and at the multi-dimensional level of teaching, process, design, you know, et cetera, change management, integration, agile. So all of our experience, we had the opportunity to bring all of it to the table. All right, answered live. We have six minutes. Uh, how did you set the container for the focus group? It's from Clifford, Washington. What questions did you ask them? How did you set up an agenda? Jeff, I mean, you want to give a light touch on this because that can yeah. be. You know, this is where, you know, we, we worked with the internal product team who, who works with a lot of market research companies uh, and, and for help facilitate the, the questionnaire, right? It goes back to objectives. What do we want to learn from, you know, the qualitative session? A lot of it was around where everyone wants to put their foot down, where they have equity. So this idea of naturals, right, was a big one. Um, the they they wanted to make sure they the you know that we had some sort of brand code. I'll call it some sort of image or illustration that communicated natural without saying it. Um, this is where, from a regulatory perspective, we couldn't say natural. Um, so there's this idea of naturals uh, really quickly. The other one was we wanted to um, look like a brand, like a brand and a leader in the space. A lot, the current packaging is very generic, and the team has gotten that for, from feedback. Um, going back to the big product descriptor, the design, it's clunky. So it needed to feel like established CPG in the personal care space um, and, and kind of queuing premium. Um, and then it needed to differentiate, right? It needed to kind of be different from, from its competitor space. So I see like those top three and maybe there's a fourth or fifth, but those were the important ones that we wanted to drive and take home. And I think one of the problems that we learned was this, and this is something that all companies deal with, they, they overcomplicate the process. You know, when, I, when we say, what are your objectives? That should be threefold. It shouldn't be, um, and there should be a prioritization from a business perspective on that. And we, we did that same approach with the qualitative testing and kept that very, very tight. There is a format and there is a science to how to design these. And if you're partnering with somebody who has that experience, um, it helps, you know, and then Jeff and Amy have had the experience of doing it for CPG. I've had the experience of doing it for um, digital. So we kind of all pulled together our experience the format, the agendas, the way you run the session, you know, the script for it, the questions. Uh, we can't, I mean, it's, that's a whole like class. Um, yeah. But um, what I will tell you is that it's very similar to how when you join a webinar, you know, one of the circles or whatever a webinar that I've hosted, um, you know, you, you baseline the audience first, you know, it's like, who are you guys? It's nice to meet you. Like, tell us a little bit about yourself. And so some of the questions are around that. 
um, you know, are you a consumer of the product? How do you relate to this category? You know, like, mm. what do you buy in this category? So you have, you know, et cetera, many, you have kids. Um, then you go into like, you know, describe the attributes. There's one, I wish I had an image. One of the exercises that Rose, who uh, was oh. a partner in this, she, she from product development, where you have to sketch your perception of, without seeing anything, of uh, everyone Notification, yeah. looking at all the sketches of what people would remember recall that packaging looked like was like oh my god this is what they're remembering we need to fix that yeah. so so the 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 tools and the techniques of that are fairly nuanced uh and come from a lot of experience doing it but mm. there's good guides online for that clifford you know it's like how to design a a focus group um i've designed focus groups days like a day-long focus group for product development and um, a large part of it is the party itself the cadence the food the logistics the agenda um, you know getting to know the people understanding their relationship to the business and to the segment how they relate to it what their needs are a user profile is the perfect way of doing it like those four questions the demographic psychographic story their 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 needs and how would they like those needs met like with their suggestions are a perfect model to design your questionnaires. That that right there will give you some of an answer. Oh. Hopefully that answers your question. It was both qualitative and quantitative. And that's it. The qualitative. What's being, the difference, Jeff, between qualitative uh, and quantitative? Qualitative is more behavioral, right? So we did qualitative where it's a Q&A, small group, very tight, under, want to understand. Um, you get more input from people in terms of how they relate to colors, to um, billboarding to specifics on the packaging, right? So that's qualitative. And then it's quantitative where it's usually a pressure check against the company and the new redesign where it's a larger scaled test. So you might have a test in the thousands, different hot points to different cities um, where your consumers are buying it, right? Midwest, the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, you're gonna get less granularity in terms of color and shapes, et cetera. But the risk there is making sure, you're making sure that the consumer is still know it's an everyone product when they see it on shelf. So I think that's about one minute. We good? Thank you, Jeff and Jose. That was amazing. Really, the, the, the deep dive into the process, I think you touched on so many different areas. I think, uh, you know, this was an uh, experimental session for, for the attendees and I, I uh, hope everybody got out of it what, um, what they came here for. Ultimately, we're so appreciative for your time, for the, the insights shared, for the you know, openness in this discussion and dialogue. And um, I think it's an it's a opportunity space for our community to take this type of approach and this type of toolkit to other businesses. You know, where are those organizations that you see an opportunity for a rebrand and how might that, um, the knowledge that you have of this process help you land those uh, gigs and, and clients for your future. So um, that's huge. And then secondly, for everybody, you know, we really are being, uh, we're taking a very close look at how business and design come together in education and really rethinking um, conversations around that from the ground up for Art Center students. We've just launched a minor in business and have a huge amount of resources that really have come from listening to people like Jose and Jeff for the last 15 or 20 years on what they need to be successful and how they need to uh, connect design to the bigger picture questions that we're all asking. So uh, that's beautiful. part of, part of Art so Center's much, future. Robert. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for, for, for doing this. That. And, Is uh, there going to be a, a survey, Robbie? It would be awesome just as a closer to yeah. have everybody post in the chat like one thing they got out of the, the, the session that was valuable to them. Mm. Um, Love that. Yes, so we that will. We, so wow. we'll definitely send out a survey. The, the survey, it will, it will have the same questions as your previous surveys have had for the bold webinars, but answer according to this particular experience that it, it's very open uh, in, in terms of how we ask the questions. So uh, that will be a place to share insights. We'll get that to Jose and Jeff. Um, and there's also, you'll, you'll have a link to these uh, and all of the webinars that we've uh, 
offered since the COVID pandemic. And that'll all be in the follow-up email. So uh, that yeah. is what we've got. And thank you everybody for, for joining us. And again, Jose and Jeff, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I'm so glad you guys are collaborators and partners and uh, you know, and, and strategists in this space together. So uh, more soon. Fun. That was important. We, you have to keep it fun. Exactly. Yeah. You guys know how to do that. <laughs> you keep it fun. All right, guys. Bye for now. Good. Ciao.